Hello, and thank you for joining me once again, Andrew Dunkley here for Astronomy Daily. Hope you're well and hope you're excited about the launch of Artemis 1, which uh, will be happening anytime soon. So uh, fingers crossed. If it's happened already, uh, which, you know, can happen with podcasts because you're listening when you want to rather than listening to a transmission live, then um, you, you probably know better than I where things are at at the moment. But uh, there's going to be plenty of news and excitement. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley. Okay, uh, let's get stuck into it. And uh, Haley has some news for us. Hi, Haley. Thanks, Andrew. Space Shirts is a new company on North Merritt Island that is producing and selling a line of colorful commemorative T-shirts to celebrate the inaugural flight of the new Orion spacecraft atop the maiden launch of NASA's Space Launch System. The company has been quite active in promoting the shirt with a busy social media schedule, including several partnerships with NASA social media accounts as well as promotion via several podcasts such as Astronomy Cast, Astronomy Daily, Space Politics, and Space News. This is a great example of how a small company can use multiple marketing channels to get word out about their new product line. All of the proceeds from the sales of these shirts go directly to the Artemis Society, a nonprofit corporation. NASA discovered the first evidence of a terrestrial-like planet outside our solar system in 1995. Known as 51 Pegasi b, it's a massive gas giant with a temperature reaching 800 degrees Celsius. Chances are, it won't be habitable, but the technology that could help NASA find a habitable planet is fascinating. Luminar Engineering is developing a new coating for a satellite skin that can automatically analyze everything from its propellants to its surface characteristics. That could help scientists better understand how a planet formed and determine whether it can support life. The technology would essentially turn the entire surface of a satellite into a sensor that tallies the chemicals present on distant planets. Last week, President Trump tweeted a photo of a charred launch pad at the Imam Khomeini Space Center in Iran, which had just experienced its third launch failure of the year. Iran's launch accident became public on Thursday after the satellite imaging company Planet released a photo that showed thick black smoke wafting across the launch pad. Early Thursday morning, Iran's state news agency Press TV confirmed that the failure was due to a technical issue with the rocket itself, according to a report from CBS News. The rocket was reported to have been carrying an experimental satellite as part of its Research Institute of Applied Physics program, according to CBS. And that's the latest news, Andrew. Okay, thanks, Haley. We'll catch up with you again shortly. Now, as much as I would like to start on a happy note, here's a story that's very much at the other end of the spectrum. China has built a 16-storey antenna and space facility in Argentina. It's in the Patagonia region, which is very remote, coincidentally. Uh, They plan to include a visitor's centre at the site, but it never appeared. Uh, That centre doesn't appear to have been built at all, and the facility is now shrouded in secrecy. Now, what is there is behind a big barbed wire fence which completely encloses the space centre's compound. The centre, as a consequence of all that, has locals on edge and there are lots of theories and rumours flying about as to what the purpose of the place is. Now, according to the Chinese, it's a peaceful venture aimed at observation and exploration. They also claim the centre had a lot to do with China's moon landing back in January. That said, the Chinese facility was built without much information offered to Argentine authorities, but it would appear that the agreement between the two countries included an obligation that China keep Argentina informed. Of further concern is that it appears there are no guarantees that the facility isn't being used for military purposes. After all, the Chinese military does run China's space program. The activity is seen as suspicious and the US government is concerned that it may be used as a listening post or a spying facility and perhaps in the long term, the militarisation of space. Now, below Australia, it appears there's a chunk of the planet that is said to be around 4 billion years old. It's a completely different piece of the planet to what we know of. 
Uh, it's a piece of crust thought to be one of the oldest parts of our living planet. Uh, the oldest piece of Earth, by the way, is uh, known to be in Canada at uh, around 4.3 billion years of age. But why is this piece down under of interest now? Well, uh, according to Max uh, Drolliner, a doctoral student at Curtin University, something special happened back then. Uh, the data suggests that many areas on Earth went through some form of preservation around 4 billion years ago. Uh, at around about the same time, the great bombardment of uh, meteorites started to wind down. So uh, what they want to do is test these areas. Now, they've been able to isolate them through satellite imagery, and they found them in the sub-levels of Earth's crust. And one of them, as we've mentioned, is under Australia. It's said to be tens of kilometres down. So very hard to get at and still a lot to learn about the, the, the different pieces of crust under um, our surface, basically. But knowing what is there and how it came to be there could help us understand how our continents formed. It is rather intriguing stuff. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley. Now, for the sky watchers amongst us, some exciting opportunities of late. The sun has been quite active and fired off a series of solar flares which have been hitting Earth's atmosphere, courtesy of Sunspot AR3089. The M class flares, M standing for, uh, M stands for moderate, by the way, uh, have caused short term radio blackouts in Europe and Africa. That's a bit of a downer, and as Fred Watson and I have discussed on Space Nuts a few times, a massive uh, solar flare or coronal mass ejection might one day cause cataclysmic damage, given how reliant we are on electronics in the modern world. Hasn't happened yet. There have been a few close calls here and there, and it's got to be timed right, but uh, you know, statistically, one day we're going to get a a broadside from the sun that's going to cause some significant damage. And I know emergency services in Australia and around the world are working on ways of dealing with this kind of emergency if all our electronics got wiped out in one fell swoop, something that we all need to be very much aware of. On the plus side, though, sky watchers have been rewarded with some stunning auroral behaviour in recent days. You just have to turn to social media to see some of the amazing photos of these incredible skies. A three-judge panel at the US Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit has ruled unanimously that the FCC is revising the rules governing satellite licensing in lower orbits reasonably reconciled the statutory tension between protecting incumbents and fostering innovation, they say. The FCC in May uh, 2018 approved SpaceX's proposal to deploy up to 11,943 small satellites operating at altitudes ranging from 715 to 823 kilometres. That, along with another licence for 71 satellites in higher orbit, brought the Constellation's total planned satellites to 12,548, which has raised a lot of concerns over space pollution, space junk, and more significantly, the interruption it causes to land-based observatories around the planet, not to mention the amateur astronomers who also feel a little bit jilted when their beautiful photos are um, developed with streaks of light from uh, internet service satellites. Uh, So uh, it it seems that um, there's been a little bit of development in that regard. It appears the decision by the US Court of Appeals did not address the underlying merits of the FCC's 2019 order, but did uphold the agency's authority to issue rules governing deployment of small satellites in low low Earth orbit. Uh, According to the plaintiff's lawyer, uh, Bloomberg Law, what is so troubling about this order is it potentially shuts down all policy-making authority at the FCC, according to lawyer John Wilson. They will have to go through a lengthy process of seeking public comment and commission vote for any rule or regulation it wants to put in place. So uh, it would appear that uh, making decisions can upset the apple cart, so to speak. Well, that's just about it. Anything else from you, Haley? 
After 36 years of helping to educate and inspire Australians about the wonders of space, through his work at the Sir Thomas Brisbane Planetarium, one of the planetarium's most beloved and well-known curators and passionate space enthusiasts, Mark Rigby, is retiring. Throughout his career under the Cosmic Sky Dome at Mount Kutha, he has presented about 15,000 shows, inspiring an estimated audience of 1 million people. Dubbed the Starman by his colleagues, Mr. Rigby described his shift in attention towards Earth. Wow. Well, we wish him well in retirement. I'm guessing he'll be able to kick back and just have some fun watching the sky for himself for a change. Thanks, Haley. We'll catch you soon. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, that uh, is the end of this episode of Astronomy Daily. Please uh, make sure you visit the spacenuts.io website and click on the Astronomy Daily tab where you can get all the latest news from around the world in astronomy and space science. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there because it's absolutely free. And please, if you've started following Astronomy Daily, the podcast, uh, please leave reviews. And uh, don't forget Space Nuts as well, the podcast I do with Professor Fred Watson. It's available online also through spacenuts.io or your favourite podcast distributor. Okay, that's a wrap. Thank you for your company. This is Andrew Dunkley for Astronomy Daily. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley.